Right, today we're going to talk about Cuba and the Cold War. This is especially important for my history of the America students that might have to write about um, the impact of the Cold War in one country that's not the United States. We're going to start off talking about Cuba in the 1950s, and we got to go to Fulgencio Batista. He's going to be the president of Cuba during World War II in the 1940s, but then again in 1952, he's going to try to run for re-election in Cuba, um, but he's going to lose. And instead of losing, he's going to orchestrate a military coup against the Cuban president. The United States government will support this government of Batista following the coup because remember, America's number one policy is the containment of communism. And as long as this guy is not a communist, even though he's not democratic, we're cool with him. Batista in power will suspend the very 1940 constitution that had previously made him president, and he's going to align himself with large landowners and American business interests in Cuba. And the United States supports him with financial aid and military aid. Now, as the president of Cuba, Batista will start to revoke political liberties, removal of a free press, banning labor strikes. Remember, he was a friend of these large American-run businesses. He's going to uh, have growing opposition to his rule that he will be um, uh, opposing quite violently with his military and his police forces. In July of 1953, Cuban lawyer and dissident revolutionary Fidel Castro will organize an uprising against the Batista regime. This revolution failed. Castro is arrested and imprisoned. But eventually he's released and he goes to Mexico to regroup and reorganize and build his revolutionary movement. It is in Mexico that Castro befriends Che Guevara, an Argentinian revolutionary who's all over Latin America and even Africa in the 1950s and 60s, um, trying to spur uh, revolutions, um, left-wing communist revolutions. With popular discontent in Cuba growing, Batista's regime becomes more and more oppressive. It is in this climate that Castro returns to Cuba in 1956 to launch a guerrilla war against the Batista regime. The revolutionaries are going to gain peasant support and um, start to grow their resistance movement. The United States encourages Batista to, to reform and calm down and stop being so repressive. We even then call on him to resign as we feel that he cannot effectively lead Cuba, but he refuses. The United States will place an embargo on arms shipments to Cuba in March of 1958 that will cripple the Batista army. And that ultimately leads to a victory by Fidel Castro on January 1st, 1959, when Batista flees Cuba. Castro's Cuba then um, is, is gonna be organized as a nationalist state with Castro's socialist leanings. He's going to call for land reform and the breaking up of large estates, no more foreign ownership of agricultural lands, the nationalization of U.S. owned oil refineries and other businesses. And this will push the Eisenhower administration to start to see Fidel Castro as a threat. We will introduce economic uh, sanctions against the uh, Cuban government including a sugar boycott that will push Castro to the Soviet Union for economic assistance. Plans for Castro's overthrow are, are, are made, and this ultimately results in the Bay of Pigs invasion that we talked about in an earlier video. The failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion will push Castro firmly into an alliance with the Soviet Union, where he declares himself a communist. The Soviet Union set up military bases in Cuba including long range nuclear missiles. In October of 1962, this is found out by American U-2 spy planes flying over Cuba and we have the Cuban Missile Crisis. The outcome of this crisis will solidify Castro's hold on his presidency and the United States trade embargo will continue against Cuba to this day. Now, as the leader of Cuba, he's gonna transform the Cuban economy from a capitalist American dominated state to a socialist state with nationalized industry and collectivized agriculture. Castro will implement a healthcare system with universal healthcare um, and large government investments, giving Cuba one of the best healthcare systems in the developing world with some of the best outcomes even compared to developed states. 
push for women's equality and rights uh, will be made through uh, guarantees of equal pay for equal work and the family code of 1975 that called for equal domestic responsibilities though the reality in Cuban homes never met the rhetoric of the Cuban government. While more Cuban, did, Cuban women um, did enter professional and governmental positions, domestic equality was not achieved and that double burden of having a job outside of the home and more responsibilities inside the home remained. Cuba is gonna nationalize their education system and a national literacy campaign started by Castro will result in the developing world's highest literacy rates. Sugar and oil industries in Cuba will be nationalized um, instead of being American controlled. The Cuban government will also support left-wing movements in Latin America and in Africa, including sending troops to fight in the Angolan Civil War. Now, Cuba under Fidel Castro had always received financial aid from the Soviet Union, but this will grow even more with Cuba joining Comicon, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, this collection of socialist communist nations that work together economically. By the 1980s, the Soviet government is subsidizing over 20% of the Cuban gross national product. Once the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991 and these supports ended, the Cuban economy will be driven into a deep recession and the Cuban government has to pull back on many of the social programs that they had created. We'll see you next time for the end of the Cold War.